we've invited Carolyn Daikon from Resources Real Estate to um, tell us about her adventures in life. Um, I had the pleasure of seeing them in their, on their home turf in northern New Jersey. Resources is a fantastic company. If you're not familiar with their area, please connect with Carolyn and Tom. Um, they run a great team. They have a great group of agents. And Carolyn's going to share about her personal journey. So Carolyn, please join me. This is not about me, actually. This is about a story about a little girl that I know. She was born just like and many other babies in post-war England, fat. They believed that fat babies were healthy babies. A very fat baby. Her parents divorced when she was 18 months old. She only saw her father a couple of times, and then again when she found him when she was 21, she went to visit him, and it was definitely not an Oprah moment. Um, it was all very anticlimactic. So not quite the uh, reunion of the stories of Oprah. At four years old, she had her tonsils removed. A few days in the hospital, mommy was far too busy to visit and best not to upset. So she didn't visit me in the hospital. On the upside, there was lots of jello from the nurses. She went away to school at age seven, and again, her mother was far too busy to visit much or even to be expected to entertain her on any holidays. So this adorable girl went to a friend's houses or, or went to friend's houses or stayed at school. All very embarrassing, I can tell you. But the first lesson here that I learned was she learned to be, oh, I mean, not me, it's not me. The first lesson she learned was to be alone and to rely on herself. Mommy thought it best to come out of private school at age 14, and I did actually play field hockey. I played the bully position, which I don't know if many of you know is the center forward, so my shins got a lot of bashings. In her new school, she was called nasty names and ostracized for being posh. Today, that is called bullying. But she learned to ignore the bad and walk away from the toxic, toxic situations. At age 15, she needed her appendix removed, and again, her mother was far too busy to come and visit in the hospital. The nurses were so compassionate and fun, and she felt so cared about and not pitied. She hates pity. She also realized that her mother, and we'll call her Mommy Dearest, was now, and I, do, I actually had a hanger, and I was thinking about wearing it on my head this morning, but a wire hanger that my husband brought last night, and I do hate wire hangers. Um, Mummy Dearest was now completely addicted to alcohol with wild mood swings. The violence would occur mainly at night. She would wake up to being beaten while pinned down uh, under the bedclothes. I, to this day, because obviously you know this is about me, um, to this day, if, if I'm in bed and my husband or any of my kids sit on the bed and, and the covers get tight, I freak out, I can't take it. So there are times when things happen to us in life that you just subconsciously take with you into the future. But I think a large part of it is to try to forget and just move on. I did learn, I'm gonna be honest and say it's me, I did learn to grit my teeth. At 16, unable to cope with the physical and emotional and psychological abuse, she left. She got a job and a flat. She learned how to care about herself. She worked at all kinds of jobs, lied about her age, and, and, and not norm, the normal way. I had to lie, I was older, not younger. Um, and watched and listened to everything she could at every job. She learned how to learn. In order to be taken seriously with no skills except being friendly, willing to try, and a little bit bright, she lied about her age, and learned how to fake shorthand. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever seen shorthand. It's a bunch of squiggles. I would just write really, really quickly and then not be able to actually read it when, when I went to do, type the letter up. So fortunately, I would have, be able to remember the gist of the letter, and I would type the letter and take it into my boss, and he would say, oh, this is not what I said. And I said, no, I just thought this sounded a little better. I hope that's OK with you, because the reality is I couldn't read my writing. But I did get recruited and promoted on one of my temp assignments. I was a temp. 
And I learned that I was good at something. I started my own consultancy business, believe it or not, and did quite well. I did rather well, actually. But she yet had to learn wisdom. Off to the south of Spain on a year-long vacation. Now, please keep in mind that glasses were very in back then, and they were very big. And I was considered reasonably attractive, even though I looked like that. I bought a villa, lay on the beach all day, drinking and dancing all night, every night, sometimes with a glass of wine on my head. I learned that I needed purpose. And I think that goes with what the gentleman before was saying. As you get older, you think you're going to retire and go fishing. You need a purpose, or I feel I need a purpose. So I couldn't just lie on the beach and, and drink all night and dance all night, although it was fun at the time, I will admit. Coming to America was next on her list, my list. Maybe her purpose was American. She loved the American spirit and the can-do attitude. Following the American dream, she got married and had a beautiful baby boy and walked hand in hand into the sunset with her new family, shortly followed by the long walk back. She had fallen into the trap that felt familiar and therefore comfortable. She had married an alcoholic. Terribly pleasant fellow, but he did fall over a lot. I learned how to break that cycle. Alone in a foreign country with a young child, she needed, oh, shut, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say she, then I'm gonna say I, because I can't remember who I am at this point. She needed to support herself and her son quickly. She did the obvious, she went into real estate. I somehow managed to find the leather bar of real estate with tough broads, one of which actually said, come outside, we'll settle this. And guys that were like in that movie, what is the movie, Coffee, Coffee is for Closers. Well, remember the guys that were sitting there not doing anything? Well, those are the guys that were in the office and they really didn't like women coming, into, coming in. And yet they couldn't figure out why I was doing business and they were just reading the paper why I was becoming more successful with them than them. And that is not me, by the way. So I learned how to hustle. Success was my only option. She learned to concentrate on what she could do, not on what others should do. Meanwhile, her ex-husband, my ex-husband's drinking got worse. He was unable to provide anything for his son, no child support, clothing, or even a book. But I got on with it. On a blind date, she met her husband of now 25 years. And I'm actually just looking at this photo for the first time for a long time. And even then, I'm dragging him, <laughs> pulling him out. <laughs> which is quite the case in some of my relationships, business and personal. It's like, okay, we're going to do this now. He's a rock, he is my rock, and my best friend. I learned stability and trust. Soon, and I will say after nine months, after we got married, um, came the patter of little girl feet to complete the family. Everyone was very happy, and it was a wonderful life. And it is a wonderful life. Every day that you have is a wonderful life. There's my kids. They don't look like that now. She learned that love is to give and receive. I wasn't very comfortable receiving love because I didn't really understand what that looked like. But I learned that family is the most important thing. Family is my why. In 2000, I started a real estate company and we were all living happily ever after because we know that's easy, just starting a real estate company. Um, we were living very happily and all living happily ever after. Suddenly, I found a lump in my breast. Um, off with their heads, I royally declared. After a double mastectomy and a double dose of chemo, I marched on. She learned that appearance is not only a small part of who you are. It doesn't matter if you're bald. You can still get up, get out, and go to work and do your best. And appearance is really only such a small part of who you are. It's really the grit that counts. During the chemo, friends brought me food and gifts. My family was right by my side. That's my daughter taking me to chemo one day. I learned to accept help, which I'd never been comfortable with. And I certainly didn't like the feeling of being vulnerable, but I learned to accept 
that in order to have the other people actually want to help you. They want to, to be able to give something of themselves when there's nothing that they can do other than food and gifts. But my hair grew back after the chemo. I slowly regained my strength and I did learn to be more appreciative of life. It gave me a much better um, vision of what was important in life. Not that I don't think money's important because I like it. <laughs> but it's what it can buy for you. Fast forward a couple of years, my cancer, aggressive little fellow, paid me another visit. This time it metastasized to my liver. I was diagnosed with stage four terminal cancer. And I don't know what happened to two and three. They didn't show up. It was just went from one to four. And of course, nobody wants to hear you have stage four cancer because there is no stage five. The news that nobody wants to hear, but there was a newly approved wonder drug for stage four terminal cancer patients that had just been approved by the FDA. And it was prescribed and everybody sighed in relief and back to normal we went. Life goes on. Okay, now what? And I said to my husband, I know, let's take the boat to Florida. So that's what we did. We brought our boat down to Florida. However, on the way down, I got the dreaded call. The drug was not working and my cancer had mutated. I was out of options. Notorious for my lists, and you can just ask my husband or anybody that knows me very well, I, my lists have lists. They're sub-lists, and then there's a master list. But anyway, uh, with a prognosis of only six months to live in December 2016, I started preparing the mother of all lists. Family wagons were circled, and we all prepared for the worst. However, I was lucky enough through good friends to, uh, uh, actually the guy that was my surgeon that removed my breast, he got me into a uh, appointment at Sloan Kettering for a, a trial study drug. Now, I didn't know that for a trial study drug, you actually have to qualify. And I felt like it was like as if I was, um, I was taking a test. But they give you so many tests just to make sure that you qualify and that your cancer is the right kind of cancer and that you're physically well enough to actually stand and, and withstand the drugs because it's still chemo. It's just oral chemo, which is why I have hair. Now, well past my expected expiration date, I'm working hard, I've ex I'm expanding the business with my wonderful partner, Tom. And many of you might recognize that photo. That was, I think, Toronto? Yeah. My family is doing well. They're no longer, the circles are no longer, or family wagons are not circled. They've gone back to their own lives, but they were invaluable to me, they were there. My son is in real estate which surprised the hell out of me because as a teenager, I thought he would amount to nothing. <laughs> and, as, and as, oh no, I tell him all the time. And as one of his teachers said, Brother Andrew, I said uh, at a meeting with my husband and I, well, you know, boys come into their own much more slowly than girls. And then there was a pause where we thought, oh yeah, yeah, he'll, he'll get there. And then he added, and some never. <laughs> which I thought he meant my son. My son, was, he would love to just look out the window and dream, but he went into real estate, gosh, I don't remember how many years ago now, and he's one of the top producers in my office. And can I tell you that he does not get any leads because I'm not showing any preferential treatment. And he's, uh, he's at the top, in the top two. Sometimes he's number one, sometimes he's number two. And that's, that's my daughter, too. When the time comes, and it will come to all of us. My family will be my biggest achievement. This will be my legacy. And there's just an assortment of pictures. One of the things I think that you'll see throughout the pictures is I'm laughing. If you don't laugh, if you can't laugh through adversity, you'll just, it'll just run you over, it'll railroad you. And here's my favorite phrase. It's not whether you get knocked down, it's whether you get back up. And every day I get back up. And as my husband and my partner know, there are many days that I, I show up, I try to show up every day, but there are many days when I'm held together with scotch tape, duct tape, chewing gum, spit, whatever it takes to get me into the office and to, to be able to perform. But on the whole, I have, better good, I have more good days than I have bad days, so I think that's a win. 
But here are the life lessons that I learned the hard way. And if you can share this with any of the agents in your office that start complaining about, oh, I have to call somebody else, or I'm tired, I don't want to do this, which I, I'm sure none of you have those kind of agents. Um, but if you can inspire uh, any of your agents to get off their butt and not let adversity stand in their way. Learn to be alone and to rely on yourself. They rely far too much on, a, uh, far too much on us as brokers. Uh, they need to learn how to support themselves and to rely on themselves, and that's when we give them stuff because they're doing it already. Learn to ignore the bad. Walk away from toxic situations. It's not worth it. If you can just look at the good and see, and I will tell you that I feel like I'm one of the luckiest people alive. And I've always felt that way. I've never felt like an unlucky person. But when I look at, the lit, when I look at my life, it doesn't look happy. It doesn't look wonderful from a, another person's perspective. But I can tell you I've chosen to look at it and just see the fun things in life. Learn how to care for yourself. Learn how to grit your teeth. And learn how to learn. I will tell you that Tom and I have a, a, a yearly list of what we're going to accomplish this year. And when it came to agent retention was one on our list. My, I had on my, uh, on my column, kiss ass. And he had on his, I put on his column, grit your teeth. Learn what you're good at and help your agents learn what they're good at. Because there's so many, you know, everybody's trying to sell agents so many gadgets and this, and it's all going to be a magic pill. And the next thing you know, you're going to be a million dollar producer because you bought this app. Well, you're not. You've got to pick up the phone, you've got to show up every day, and you've got to go back to basics. Learn to find a purpose. And that is subject to change because we never know what's coming around the next corner. Learn to break the cycle. This, I, I get very annoyed with people that get stuck and they're in their own way. Get out of your own way, break the cycle. I don't care that your mother was this or your dad was this or your brother was that or, oh, I, well, when I have more money, I'll do that. Or, but I can't take yes butters. And I tell people when I do training in my office, if anybody yes butts me, you're out of the room. Learn to hustle. Success is your only option. Learn to concentrate on what you can do. And many, I'm talking to the wrong audience for this. You guys already know all this. But if you can take away and give something to one of your agents, or if it helps any one of you, then I'm happy that I was able to stand up and share this story with you, which I really don't know why I did decide to do this, but it just seemed like a good idea at the time. Learn to find stability and learn who you can trust. Learn that love is to give and to receive. And maybe that's not a lesson that other people need to, to find. I, for me, I didn't know that love came my way. I thought it only went one way. Uh, learn that appearance is only a smart part of who you are. It's the grit that counts. Learn to accept help and to feel vulnerable. That's the greatest gift that cancer gave me. Life is random. It really is. Focus on the good, not the bad. Have a good time. Take your business seriously, but never take yourself too seriously. And can you believe I'm actually being honored here uh, for, by the Red Cross, the Humanitarian Award, and I still did that. <laughs> it was a table decoration, and I just thought of Las Vegas and put it on my head. This is a Christmas party. I'm not the one with the beard. I'm, with, I'm the pirate on the other side. I stuck my mascara in my eye two days before Christmas, or two days before our Christmas party. And I literally, it was, it was awful. And I, torn, I had torn the uh, retina, so I had to wear a patch. So I just made the best of it and showed up and wore a patch. And that's me just being silly with my husband and you know, really reminding him which, who's the top dog in our relationship. <laughs> So um, when I was going through chemo the first time, which is a bitch, um, I'll be honest with you, the, um, I would take a photo of myself at chemo every time or have somebody else where I was like this because I always felt if there was somebody out there that had been diagnosed with cancer and they thought, I'm not doing chemo, it's too scary. And believe me, it almost kills you. My husband says I was a shadow of myself. But it, you get through it. So I took a picture every month or every three weeks, I think it was, of myself at chemo to, and put it on Facebook and just hope that if it helped one person get through it, then that was, the, that was my purpose for that. 
Um, and the rest is just life is fun. So just try to ignore all the bad bits and keep moving forward. Yeah, like Winston Churchill says, when you're going through hell, keep going. All right, any questions? I'm not normally a shy person. I can do birthday parties if you'd like me to come and get rid of the kids. Any questions? And feel free, believe me, I'm an open book. The miracle, well, the miracle, first miracle drug was Ibrance, which had just been approved by the um, FDA. But because my cancer had mutated, that didn't work. So the drug that I'm on now is a study drug. It's still in trial, um, but it, it works. So that's the good news. And yes, there are a lot of side effects, and some of them are um, not great. One of my um, favorite ones is um, my body thinks, and this is a side effect of the cancer, not of the chemo. My body thinks, because my liver is damaged, I'm an alcoholic. So it sends fluid because it thinks that I have cirrhosis of the liver. So it sends fluid all through my body, which gets trapped in the pockets of between my skin and whatever else is in there. I have had swinging parts filled with fluid that I didn't even know you could have swinging parts filled with fluid. When your knees or like hanging down the back of you and your leg, your ankle collapses onto your foot. Not a fun thing, but I go for, when it gets bad, and it has to get bad before they can get the fluid out because there's not enough pressure. I go and I get it aspirated. And at one point last May, determined to get to my daughter's graduation, they actually got off 17 kilos of fluid. Was it kilos? Liters, sorry, <laughs> foreign. <laughs> Um, which is about 35 pounds of fluid that I was dragging around and was crushing my, um, crushing my organs. But um, yes, there's lots of fun side effects, unfortunately, but there's no choice. You know, you do what you gotta do. Did that answer the question? There's a choice and you made the right choice. Well, I think there's only one choice. You know, I don't see myself as particularly brave or, and, and I, well, one of the oddest things that I think really prompted me to send post photos on Facebook during the chemo. I wasn't even aware that I was thinking of not doing it because it does almost kill you. But I wasn't consciously thinking that. But my daughter said to me, you're gonna do the chemo, right? And I went, yes, of course. Because it really brought it home to me. It's not just about, it's not, even though it's my decision, it's my body, you have a family that you owe it to, or you owe it to yourself to, to do absolutely everything you can. So that's why I posted the chemo photos, because I thought, well, if somebody out there that has been told they have chemo, I want them to say, hey, look, it doesn't look that bad. You know, I mean, I had meetings in the hospital rooms while I was getting chemo. Um, I just didn't want to let it get in my way. Um, I have meetings, I had a meeting with Tom last week while I was getting a blood transfusion. Because you're just sitting there with a needle in your arm. So you can do other things. So yes, those are my, those are my fun, there's a lot of side effects, but you really don't want to know about them all. <laughs> They're not pretty. Um, you know, we have a, uh, another dear friend, um, cancer survivor, who's not here today, uh, Jimmy Walberg, as we all know. Yeah. So I listened to your story, and both of you have amazing grit. Really. It's so grit that counts. Yeah. So you are a thriver, cancer survivor. Yeah, I don't like when people say, oh, you're, a, you know, when people say, um, <clears throat> you know, you're gonna kick cancer's ass and you know, you're fighting cancer. You don't fight cancer. And you kind of just roll into a ball, do what you're supposed to do, get out of bed every day and try to make an appearance and convince yourself that you look quite good with the chemo hat as I ruined Tom's wedding photos because I was one of the people at the wedding and I thought, well, I had color coordinated ones. So I thought that um, I look quite good actually. 
And then when I saw the photos, I realized, like, oh, my God. But you, you, roll, you roll into a ball. This is what I did. I rolled into a ball, clenched my fists, grit my teeth, and then just do whatever you have to do to roll into the next day. But there's no ninja. There's no ninja in all of us that can kick cancer's ass. You can just do what you can do and not give up. Never, ever give up. Another Winston Churchill's quote. I know I look a bit like him. <laughs> Any other questions? Kay. Let me just say a few words. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> the two of us up here. here. I don't know who's going to hold who up. I'm all right. I'm all right. But, you know, uh, you're a miracle, really. Oh, thank you. Because uh, Megan and I came to visit your company and had a great day with Tom, and, and you weren't to be mm. found. Yeah. And, and uh, to see you show up at this meeting and share your, your life is, is, just, is such a blessing to all of us. We're so happy you're doing well. Oh, thank you. I'm happy I'm doing well, too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So thank you so much, Caroline. I think Kay had a quick question, and then I'll get, I'm, I probably ran over, so I'll, no, I'm right on time. I just, well, first of all, what, a, what an inspiration you are. But I was just curious, when, um, when you were first diagnosed, did you share that with your agents and Obviously, probably was, was the second time when I got the terminal cancer prognosis, I had a cancer party. Yeah, I had a, <laughs> I had a party in my backyard and, um, and basically announced that I had cancer and I was going to be there as much, you know, they'd come back and that I was going to be there as much as I could. And, um, you know, I wasn't going to let it get in my way as much as I had any control over it. But yes, I shared it with my office because I didn't want them to think I just disappeared. And the first time, actually, come to think of it, I did share it at an office meeting, you know, and sort of made light of my breasts disappearing. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Can we have the economists come back up and finish and make them laugh?